All right. Thanks for having me, guys. So today's topic is going to be around the where's your secret decoder ring for invalid certificates. This actually came up. Uh, my role at NetScout is a pre and post sales, so I go to customers and make sure that the value of they're getting from the product is good. Uh, this actually came out from a customer who said that they're rolling out their PKI uh, installation. I'll cover what PKI is, if anyone who isn't familiar. The PKI installation that they were rolling out, they weren't necessarily aware of, is everybody using it? Um, obviously, there are some risks involved if you don't utilize signed certificates, and especially if you invest the money, more importantly, your time, to get the project approved and actually work the project, you actually want it to be successful. You want to make sure everybody's using it. So with that, what is uh, this lovely thing we call PKI? So with PKI, it's uh, defined by 6818 RFC, essentially a means, a policy, people, hardware, everything, the, the whole shebang to provide a certificate to your end user or end device. Now with that, your goal is to authenticate it typically is the main reason for it. So if we were to go into a situation where folks aren't using your PKI, uh, they could essentially have a, an instance where you load, say, a new Cisco device online or pick whatever vendor, and it typically comes with a self-signed certificate, including stuff that we provide. Well, the, the nice thing is, is that every time you visit that page, I'm actually skipping ahead here, I've already kind of covered what we would use this for. Think of online banking. SSL is the number one item that typically you utilize. Um, you get this error message. People always just click ahead, and they don't care about it. I mean, we see this in other, other things. And maybe some of us are even guilty of this. But the thing is, is that without this, uh, when you have this invalid certificate, you never will know if somebody's actually circumvented and provided you know, basically a man-in-the-middle attack because you're just constantly clicking, hey, okay, yeah, let's just get, let me do my work. In the meantime, you are providing them a way for doing decryption of your traffic, providing the keys of the kingdom, potentially, depending on the type of device you have. So this is the, the problem that came to us. And there is, it's not an easy problem to necessarily fix, per se. Uh, there might be a vendor out there that provides it, I don't know. But in the meantime, we had, uh, an issue. We provide like a, uh, a packets and things of that nature. We give access to packets. We do more than that, but long story short, we have the packets. We have the transmission of the packets. So we have this great resource, and you can get that packet not just from a vendor like Netscout, but you can do it from your laptop. Uh, a lot of the various different hardware manufacturers are pro uh, providing you an ability to provide like, to obtain these packet captures. So this could be. Uh, basically, say web traffic is what we'll use for our continued discussion. So, how do we detect it? This is where we get kind of a little bit no more nerdy about this situation. So, you typically have your three-way handshake, SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK, that opens up the socket for the communication between your client and your server. Now we get into the actual TLS handshake if you are utilizing TLS. There are some cases where you'll see SSL version 3, Long story short, usually, usually you're looking at TLS traffic. So we're interested in our certificates. So the question is, how do I obtain access to my certificate while it's being transmitted? You do so through the server hello. It's actually, after the TLS, it's a second packet that comes across. The server hello is what actually contains that information that you, what we care about for this topic at least. So when we look at that packet capture, we can identify an invalid certificate by a couple different means. First one is this is a, a issuer. This is the person who provided it. And then the subject is your certificate. And in this case, we can see that the, both of them are the same. So in this case, we can see it is a self-signed certificate. My, uh, my certificate matches the person who signed it and said, hey, I'm a great guy. Also in this, we can have this field for validity. Is your certificate expired? Not as cool as utilizing an invalid certificate, but nonetheless, still important. If we expand that, we can see that, well, that's pretty big. Um, but you can see that this is the time that it's valid, and this is the time where it would expire. So in this particular case, what is our problem statement? 
well, we're deploying a PKI installation or we're, we have instances where we need to validate the authenticity of our certificates and how they're being utilized. Uh, we look at the information, this case HTTPS, TCP port 4.3, and we look into the server hello, which is the a third packet in after, or excuse me, the second packet in after the three-way handshake. That information provides us that certificate as well as that time frame. So, how do we actually go about detecting it, scripting it out, looking at the information? This is actually the worksheet I used. Um, whenever I design a script, I do flow diagrams to best optimize it. Needless to say, when you're looking at attacking this type of situation, and this could be true for any type of packet scripting capabilities. This isn't like a NetScout solution per se. This is, NetScout has a solution for it, but you can do this with Wireshark, and there's other tools available as well to script out this process, to find invalid certificates. So in the case, essentially what we want to do is eliminate all the fluff. So what is that traffic that you're interested in? Well, in this case, it's HTTPS. So a source port of 443. Why? The certificate always originates from the server. Again, it's a server hello message that we care about. Once we get that information, we can pop into the uh, basically a pattern filter to make sure that it works. I'll provide that pattern filter. You guys still post the presentations up, correct? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. So the, in those cases, I have provided the pattern filters that you can utilize to do this exact mechanism. So if we look at what we're interested in doing is first IPv4 filtering the information out to try and figure out what, what do we care about. This is just my script just so, so I can remember off what I did. Um, in this case, what we have is we, you first look for interesting traffic based off of the, your most simplest platform, which is the TCP port number, the source port. Who's my server? That's the main thing you want to think of if you embrace this strategy for, say, certificates, but in really what I'm doing is deep packet inspection, pulling out information. So with that, you can think of various different items that you may be interested in. If you're doing a forensics investigation, maybe instead of you're looking for certificates, now we're looking for keywords. Same practice applies. So before I get to that, we look for our pattern. I'll provide you the patterns I utilize for the various different versions of TLS and SSL v3. And in that particular case, we're just trying to get our interesting traffic for those certificates. We go into our sniffer output. Essentially, if you choose to, a lot of times you guys are interested in actually having the raw packets should you have to, ever have to come back to them. Sorry, new clicker. So in this case, what we have here, this is your pattern that you're interested in. Essentially, if you look for SSL version 3, you're going to find that that pattern is true across the board. And there's minor changes, which I'll actually cover in the final slide. Essentially, though, if you provide this mask, you'll find all, uh, all server hellos that have your certificate in your traffic. So even if you don't deploy anything else, if you just build a filter in Wireshark, you can utilize this to narrow out the packets that you're interested in for SSL certificates that are coming across the wire. So then the next is the capabilities to pull out the information that you care about. If you, uh, if you decide to go home, and I bet all, everybody is, is going home and create your own script with this information, you can actually use the, these, fil these offsets I've uh, provided here to pull out the issuer and the subject information. This also hopefully will, um, maybe this application doesn't help you. Maybe you're not deploying a PKI. Maybe there's another item that you're trying to look for. Maybe it's a particular certificate. You can utilize these same offsets to help you find your certificate. So this is the actual raw output of my file that I did uh, for these folks. And essentially, the short term is, is that what we have outputted is our certificates, our issuer, our subject line. We can use awk or any type of utility that you guys care about or like or favorite, uh, is that you can utilize those to compare those cell values to see if line A matches line B. If they do, they're invalid certificates. So it's been a while. So this is actually my last slide, so I wasn't sure necessarily how long you wanted to actually hear me banter on about this. So just again, you can actually perform this entire task with Wireshark. They open, they provide the abilities 
There's a whole wiki page for Wireshark scripting capabilities. And if you're interested in the SSL version, TLS, TLS 1.1 with their filtering, uh, you can utilize those masks with those, that string to locate that information. Um, I put all my stuff up that I come up with on the, a, a particular blog, which I'll send to Greg if he's interested. So with that, do you guys have any questions about maybe the use case I've demonstrated here or maybe another use case using scripting to locate X information within a packet? Yes, sir? From my viewpoint, it becomes a business risk because it becomes a, um, not a liability, but a reputational risk. Does a, when the customer visits your website, whether that's internal or external, will they pay attention to that lock, depending on whatever business model you're in? And if they are, and mo most people are, if they've gotten used to that green bar or that, that padlock, as soon as it's broken, it's more of a reputational risk that people are going to say, hey, I won't do business with them because of that. Now, just like how there's that red screen that says, hey, invalid certificate, don't go here, and people still click on it, obviously people will still go. But that said, I think it's more of a reputational risk than anything else just because it helps pays, pays our bills. Yeah, that, uh, that's from the Chromium effort, and there is quite a, a bit of deadline, but um, it's the lifetime and lifetime of the certificate, so they're giving you up to like 2017 for like the final totally broken. So as long as the max lifetime, you have a little so you, um, okay, sorry. So yeah, it's, it's just it's just a transition, but it appears to be so. It's probably only Chrome for now. Uh, the other vendors, I don't think, have really been that strict yet. But it's yeah. a discussion now. And I mean, you could utilize something towards this effect rather than keying in on the version. You go back a few, and it's actually interesting enough. I might just go through it and do this while my wife's watching like one of the TV shows, reality shows, or whatever, um, to find that Shaw statement. So I think it's good, and you could use you could apply that definitely. It's just shifting from the certificate forward. Um, the two places where you would find that is the client hello. The client hello actually says, "Hey, this is all the the uh, different types I support," and the server comes back and says, "Hey, these are all of them that I support." And I'm skipping through slides. All right. So with that though, that's how we, I would tackle that. And uh, risk of using it versus something well, else. You know, if, if you have it set up with TLS encryption on both and both email servers and things like that, there's a possibility that you know one end isn't configured properly or something changes that there's information being sent that's not being encrypted. Well, so in saying that all the, all the configuration sides were equal and so on and so forth, there are various different parameters that you can set that make the ability for someone to steal the, the private certificates and doing the decryption. Right now, you put me on the spot. I can't think of it if somebody can help me out. Is, is it um, Def Hyman? If you select Def Hyman, I think that's the one that will actually not permit the decryption of the actual payload. So if you, basically, that just becomes a, a discussion as if you want to secure this and you want to prevent absolutely all decryption, even tools that might be doing support, you essentially look at those uh, different ciphers and so forth that you pick the, which, the one that best suits your needs. And it sounds like you need one that is not able to be decrypted after the fact, even if you have the private key. Anybody else? New laser pointer, I can, no. Oh. So, Yeah, yeah, but a big club works. I mean, uh, essentially what we end up doing is utilizing awk 
to figure out these two values and only going after the ones where the issuer and the subject line were they exactly the same. So it's like if uh, one equals F2 something towards that effect, print. Uh, at that point, I would do that and only attack those. And then at that, after that, I would just constantly ha go after their manager. Or utilize the password that you just obtained by them using the wrong credentials and then log into their email, send some things, you know, whatever. All right. Oh. Oh, um, have you thought of using it? I know there's like commercial products out there like uh, Benefy and some other ones mm -hmm. that they actually scan your whole network. I mean, I never thought of doing it at this level. I think they use uh, a different scanning technique. But yeah, um, for looking for near expiration certificates, because you know sometimes you have oh. administrator churn and exactly you know, abandoned and they're, they, they haven't updated their certificate and it's expired. The, the biggest problem with this approach is that the placement or the ability to go across your entire network, so there's going to have to be a choke point. Uh, that, that choke point is going to be one that is either probably going to be like your data center access layer, maybe there's going to be an edge, depending on your approach. If you're going after a web server or if you're going after more like the administrative components. Doing so, it would actually be, it's a good idea because you can utilize aggregation switching. Aggregation switching is huge right now um, where you can take multiple different tap points or spam points from different places in your network, aggregate them to one location, and have your script just start churning that information. And because you're only looking for uh, certain port numbers like 443 or you're looking for um, IMAP or whatever your use case is, you utilize that filter I mentioned earlier with that source port because that's all you care about is that server cert. So you can cut down your traffic, and that's really what becomes a battle once you start scaling this out, is the amount of CPU you're going to dedicate to just churning through certificates. And you can limit that, and you can limit the bandwidth on your tool by proper TCP filtering, or UDP, uh, ahead of time. Yes, sir? So in your testing, do you also deal with wildcard certificates? A little bit, yes. Same, so the wildcard wouldn't match. Exactly. The so it, I've tried to, I've come across it, and I'm trying to determine the best course of action from this script capability. Um, this is purely a hobby thing I came up with, and I'm trying to gain support from my company, but we'll see what happens with that. But it's a good point, though. Wildcard certificates would be interesting. Anything else? Yes, so that's what I was mentioning earlier. If you do the, oh, I'm sorry. So we utilize the validity date. Uh, Auk also, I've been become a fan of Auk, so forgive me if you're a sad fan. But um, you can do the math. Exactly. You can have it do the math for you to do that uh, formula to output into it. Um, I just haven't had a use case where folks have asked me for the validity. I've been trying to advocate the validity towards the earlier statement about it, some expiring at 2017. Um, so that's a point. And it can be easily added into ne the next line into the script file. So. I think it'd be interesting to see, do like a certificate pinning type thing to see if the same server represents any difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so how I'm trying to think, because you could key in on the, so the big thing is, is that, what was it, TLS version 1, they started permitting more, more than one certificate per IP address. So with that, you would have to compare the SNI field. So if you did the SNI field, which is a server name indicator, essentially it's the client saying, hey, I'm interested in uh, CNN.com or something towards that effect. Comparing the SNI field, it, that you would basically, if it has the same SNI and it has the same certificate, or well, sorry, multiple different SNIs with the same certificate, then it would be invalid. Tests against like a location list? I have not. No, I haven't actually, but that's a fantastic use case because at that point, you could even build that into your awk script to have in there and uh, or said, sorry. <laughs> um, 
you can build that in there because in reality, that issuer starts out with the same four hex usually. Yeah. Um, so at that point, it's not like an extensive computational requirement for your box to take care of. So I'm going to have to write some of these down. <laughs> all right. All good? Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Good to see you again. Good to see you. <laughs>